Great. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Erin Kuprowitz. I am a professor and the vertebrate collections manager at the University of Connecticut in Stores, Connecticut, USA. Um, and it is my pleasure to welcome you now to our symposium, which is titled Plant Animal Interactions in a Changing World, Implications for Seed Fates in the Anthropocene. Um, so we have our speakers here. And I just have a couple of housekeeping measures to take care of and kind of announce before we start the talks. Uh, so just remember that as with all the talks you've seen so far, you can submit your questions to the speakers through the Zoom Q&A function. Don't use the Whova question function at all. We're using the Zoom interface for that. And also when you ask your questions, you can do that at any time during the talks. And we will be monitoring those, answering what we can through chat. But you can also, uh, you need to indicate which speaker you're addressing your question to. Okay, so again, it is my pleasure. We have four speakers today. Uh, I will very quickly introduce everybody before we begin. Uh, the first speaker that we have will be myself. Again, Erin Kuprowitz. I'm based at the University of Connecticut. Our second speaker will be Sandra Correa at the uh, Mississippi State University. Our third speaker will be Ons Razafindratsim, and she's based at UC Berkeley in California. And finally, we have Lauren Maynard, She'll be speaking to us uh, from Virginia Tech. I think that's everything I need to go over today. Again, submit questions during any time, and we will have a live Q&A session about 15 or, or so minutes at the end of the talks. So we will answer your questions live as well. So stay tuned for that. And we are now ready, Javi, to start the talks. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, welcome to my talk in the Seed Fate Symposium. Today I'll be talking about upslope seed dispersal potential and optimal germination temperature and how these shape current and potentially future ranges of tropical plants, especially considering a suite of species of large woody species in a tropical mountain in northwestern Costa Rica. So we all know that the world is warming incredibly fast due to human anthropogenic effects uh, in the Anthropocene. And as the earth warms, we are already seeing and we're expecting much more rapid upslope ecosystem shifts. So in the tropics, especially if animals and plants in the lowlands can't tolerate or adapt quickly to new hotter temperatures, they have to move up mountains. They have to shift upslope. 
Uh, and because plants are sessile organisms, except when they're seeds, I am really interested in knowing how plants are going to get to these new habitats um, as ecosystems shift upslope. How are plants going to get there? One way that plants can move around and move up tropical mountains is by using animals. And in the case of the seeds that I'll be talking about today, I'm talking about large terrestrial mammals. So things like peccaries, agoutis, tapirs. Uh, so there's this concept I like to present called seed elevators. So here you can see a peccary as a little elevator and it's actually in the lowlands, it's ranging around, it's eating seeds, it's swallowing seeds and it's moving upslope. Maybe it's tracking a fruiting phenology or something like that. And it's depositing seeds as it moves upslope. So it's taking seeds from the lowlands, it's shifting ecosystems, it's moving upslope as it's tracking something while it moves up in this kind of vertical seed dispersal and it's dropping seeds, it's pooping them out, it's spitting them out, it's carrying them and putting these seeds into new upslope environments as the seed elevator moves around. So keep that concept in mind when we're thinking about what I present to you today. This is the study site, so Volcan Barva in northwestern Costa Rica, where La Selva Biological Station is at the base of this tropical mountain. It ranges up to 2,800 meters above sea level, and the lowlands are about zero to 500 meters above sea level. So when I talk about the lowlands, I'm mentioning the, the life zone of tropical lowland wet forest spanning about zero to 500 meters. The average daily temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. You can get lows and highs of 20 and 30 degrees Celsius respectively. So it's already pretty warm in the lowlands. A lot of people think that organisms are already living close to their thermal maxima. So I wanna know what happens to lowland seeds if they can shift up slope and survive. I'll be talking also about tropical pre-montane forest at a thousand meters. The temperature is a little bit cooler up there. And finally, another site that I'll be discussing is this tropical montane forest site located around 2000 meters above sea level. And again, you can see the temperatures dropping a little bit more as you shift upslope. Uh, there's also cloud forest on this mountain, but we're not going to be talking about that today. So getting into the experiments that I ran and uh, the, some of the data that I'll present to you today, uh, I'm presenting a subset of kind of a larger experiment just because I'm really restricted with time. So if you're really interested in this, contact me by email, ask me questions when we have our Q&A period, and I can go into a little bit more detail. I'd be happy to explain more about this project with you. So thinking about the field experiments we did, seedling transplants. So we used five lowland species, three palms, the Arcaceae and two Fabaceae. These are large seeded seeds uh, and, and seedlings that come from large seeds. So every seed is at least two, three centimeters in diameter. They're very large. So we had control treatments, which you can see with the blue arrows. So we took these lowland species, they're naturally found not above 500 meters in elevation. And we took them and transplanted them as a control group in their native uh, elevation in the lowlands. And we also had an upslope transplant treatment in 1000 meters where we took these lowland species and shifted them into pre-montane forest. And we also had a, an even larger upslope shift into the 2000 meter montane forest. Uh, and we assessed seedling survival in all three of these treatments for all of these five species. And sample sizes, things like that, we had about 20 uh, individuals of each species at each elevation that we moved around. So overall, lowland seedlings uh, did their best at middle elevations, which was really surprising. So in the lowlands, uh, they were attacked by uh, herbivores pretty significantly. So this is their native elevation. They faced a lot of mortality due to branch fall, tree fall in the lowlands. But at middle elevations, we had really high survival after a year. So here you can see the proportion of seedlings alive on the y-axis. Uh, over time uh, in days on the x-axis for each of these figures representing each of those five species. The little green circles show the highest survival after that one year census. And for the most part, it's in the middle elevations in the pre-montane forest. 100% uh, of the seedlings died within the year at the 2000 meter elevation. So it's probably uh, due to increased moisture and cooler temperatures, but we're still kind of digging into uh, 
the mortality agents at that elevation. But basically 100% mortality in the 2000 meter site, very high survival in the lower elevations, um, especially that middle elevation. The lowlands suffered fair amounts of mortality uh, and most of that was due to biotic agents and tree falls. So the middle elevations were great. Seedlings did very well, despite that not being their native habitat. They were able to jump ecosystems upslope. So shifting from this field transplant experiment into the lab, we also had six lab treatments where we looked at germination of those same five lowland specific species. You can see we had six incubators. These are static temperature incubators. We're shifting this now for dynamic temperatures. But for this experiment, we only used static constant temperatures at each of those treatments. So 10 degrees, 15, 20, 25, 30, and 35 degrees Celsius. And this range of temperatures represented the min, mean, max, and the max plus five degrees Celsius, or the what we're calling global warming temperature for these seeds. And again, think back to the, the averages, the average temperatures they're experiencing in the lowlands. Um, we wanted to make them experience cooler temperatures and hotter temperatures and see how they germinated. So we measured germination success uh, over time for all five of those species. So here you can see the figures. Again, the, the three palms are at the top and the two Fabaceae are at the bottom. Percent of germination on the y-axis over time represented in days. And overall, and again, this was kind of surprising to me, lowland species were able to germinate very, very well at high temperatures, some of them at extremely high temperatures. So even beyond what they would normally experience and into that global warming uh, temperature treatment that we had. They didn't do well in the colder temperatures, which also kind of was reflected in our seedling transplant experiments where seedlings didn't do well in the colder temperatures at higher elevations. Um, but it seems that these large seeds are almost buffered or they, they just do really well at high temperatures and they're able to have really high germination success. Some of these like the Pentaclethra macroloba in the bottom right did extremely well, 100% germination at the global warming temperature and below. Uh, but again, the colder temperatures they did not like. So what does this all mean for plant migrations, for plant shifts up tropical mountains in the Anthropocene? Going back to our basic questions at the start that I threw at you, do upslope barriers exist to prevent plant range expansions? At 1,000 meters, no, not for these five species. They, we saw very high seedling survival. In fact, higher survival at middle elevations compared to their native habitats. However, at 2,000 meters, that even bigger elevational jump, yes, we did see a strong biotic, uh, abiotic barrier to seedling survival. Can lowland seeds tolerate warming? Yeah, they really can. Uh, we, we're kind of working with this further and incorporating dynamic temperature setups now, but large seeds of the Fabaceae and Ericaceae were very resilient to warming, which is good uh, in terms of how fast our climate is warming. Can upslope plant movements outpace, outpace global warming? We're not sure. So we're still working on this uh, and we have ongoing experiments tracking seeds and uh, hopefully animals in the future to look at seed elevators. So kind of going back to the big picture, plant animal interactions are integral to healthy forests Seed arrival to new upslope habitats is possible, maybe, we're still doing these experiments, uh, but we need more on the ground data on fates and animal tracking. Seedlings do do well at some novel upslope habitats. And again, large seeds are very tolerant to global warming and can potentially avoid uh, the effects of lowland biotic attrition. So that was a really quick uh, overview of everything. If you do have questions, ask me in the Q&A or send me an email here. Thank you very much, bye-bye. Hello, and thank you all for watching my video. My name is Sandra Viviana Correa, and today I'm going to present research where I am looking at whether we can use fruit traits to predict mutualistic versus antagonistic interactions between frugivores and seeds. And this is a collaborative research with several colleagues in Brazil, Colombia, and here in the US. As most of you know, vertebrates disperse seeds of approximately 70 to 95% of woody plant species in tropical forests. 
And as you know already, so seed dispersal is a very important ecological process where the frugivores contribute to shape the composition of plant communities. Uh, they contribute to expand the range of species and also to increase gene flow among populations. And in turn, fruit is a very important resource for fruitivores that provides energy and um, helps them to achieve all the metabolic functions. Now, for a long time, researchers have been um, debating whether there are seed dispersal syndromes. And this concept was first introduced in the 80s. And what it argues is that fruitivores select sets of correlated fruit traits and that those traits match the fruitivores behavior, the morphology, and the physiology. And uh, because frugivore and seed dispersal enhances the fitness of both plants and animals, then it is argued that the seed dispersal mutualism is maintained through natural selection. Now, in a seminal work, uh, Silvia Lomascolo and colleagues actually provide evidence of the existence of seed dispersal syndromes. Particularly, they demonstrate that the Borg syndrome is characterized by fruits that are, don't have a smell, so are non-odorous, have high contrast against the canopy or against the background, um, and then fruit, those fruits that are uh, consumed by birds are selected by, by birds, are, tend to be smaller, softer, and darker in color. And interestingly, in contrast, they found that the bad syndrome um, is uh, characterized by larger fruits that are harder and lighter in color, so they have low contrast, and tend to be aromatic. So, and one thing that is interesting is that this uh, only explains 42% of the variance in uh, fruit characteristics. So what this means is that there is great variability in fruit traits in natural ecosystems. Now, the question is, well, is there a fish syndrome? And why is this important? Well, uh, it is because there are nearly 300 fish species that eat fruits and seeds. Uh, half of them are distributed in the tropics and they disperse or actually they consume and um, most likely disperse seeds of nearly 600 neotropical plant species. And it has been demonstrated that fish and water have different seed dispersal patterns. So the patterns of the position and movement of seeds are different. And what is interesting is that fish can serve both as seed dispersers and seed predators. Another thing that is interesting about fish is that they evolved, at least in South America, fish evolved during the diversification of the angiosperms, and they are much older than most of the other vertebrate groups uh, within um, assemblages in, in uh, South American wetlands. So, what, um, so this brings a question on whether frugivorous fish contribute to shape fruit trade evolution in wetlands via natural selection. And if that is the case, can we use fruit traits to predict mutualistic versus antagonistic interactions? So we conducted a study in the Pantanal wetland, which is located in central Brazil. Uh, we sampled both fish and plants in the riparian flood forest. In the Cambarasal, which is a monodominant flood forest with Bochicia divergence and in flood savannas. And we assess fruit traits both in terms of morphology and nutrient composition and then also fish diets. So we uh, quantified 
the identity and amounts of intact and masticated seeds. Okay, now these are the morphological traits that we measure uh, for 50 plant species and over 1,000 individual fruits and seeds. We assess characteristics of the diaspora, the seed, and as well as macronutrients of both diaspora and seeds. And then we look at fish diets during four years in the flood season, uh, 12 fish species and over 1,000 individual fish. In red are values for 2014, which is uh, the results I'm going to show you today. And notice that there are cases of seed dispersal, seed predation, in a few cases of fruits that were not consumed by fish. Uh, one of the things that we look at was uh, trying to assess phylogenetic signal in the morphological traits. And out of the different traits that we assess, there was only a few that where we were able to detect phylogenetic signal. And you can see that through these red dots uh, based on the Moran index. So now, these are the methods that we use to try to predict seed dispersal from fruit traits. Um, to account for phylogenetic signal, we did a principal coordinate analysis on the plant species phylogenetic tree that was generated in ape. And then we extracted five aching vectors that account for 33% of variance. And then we use machine learning classification algorithms, particularly random forest and linear discriminant analysis. And because of our, of our our observations are based on diets, then we have an unbalanced sample size, so an unbalanced number of cases, so we use a correction. And we use 70% of the data as training and 30% for data, uh, excuse me, for testing. Now, this is very important because the assumption is that if the model can correctly identify cases of seed dispersal based on fruit traits, then I will interpret that as selection by fish. So these are the results of random forests. This is again 2014 data only, and we're not including nutrient composition here. Uh, what you can see is that Random forests are able to identify a set of characteristics that are important at classifying seed dispersal and seed predation that includes shape, buoyancy, and size. Now, here is the model precision. So, random forests have high accuracy and they're actually able to uh, predict seed dispersal over seed predation in a pretty high percentage. And the same was the case for linear discriminant analysis, where the cases of seed dispersal versus seed predation were even higher. Now to the question, do frugivorous species pose selective pressure on fruit traits in wetlands? The answer is yes. And also morphological fruit traits seem promising at predicting seed dispersal and selection by fish. Um, now, the characteristics that seem more important at predicting this selection are the shape of both diaspora and seeds, as well as diaspora buoyancy and seed sites. And these are characteristics related to uh, limitations of the gap size, but also where the fish can encounter the fruits. The next steps are to remove correlated variables to assess interspecific and multi-year differences using the full data set, analyze other traits, including nutrients and color, look for alternative classification methods, and alternative methods to account for phylogenetic signal. Thank you very much. Today I'm going to present a preliminary study we are conducting on how the impact of creating edges of forest habitat as a result of fragmentation, known as edge effect, may influence uh, seed dispersal interactions in a rainforest in Madagascar. 
As you may already be aware, um, habitat loss and fragmentation have been among the most important threats to forest ecosystem. And currently, a large proportion of forest areas around the world exist within one kilometer of an edge due to habitat loss and fragmentation. So understanding the impact of age creation and the responses of ecological processes to age is very critical because such knowledge can help us predict the impact of forest fragmentation on forest structure. And it can also help us design some conservation action and management practices for maintaining biodiversity. In forest ages, uh, some, habit, some abiotic factors can act as an environmental filter that may prevent or favor the establishment of certain species. So for example, reduced soil moisture or increased exposure to sunlight at the age of the forest may prevent the establishment of certain plant species. And along with these abiotic factors, um, changes in ecological processes and species interactions can also act as a potential filter. This is, for example, the case of seed dispersal by animals, uh, also known as soil quarry. In fact, animal-mediated seed dispersal can act as a potential filter for plant communities by limiting or increasing uh, seed supply. So either way, uh, it will affect the initial template of plant community structure, which may ultimately affect the pattern of species called, uh, occurrence and diversity in a local community. So in a sense, um, age effect can result in changes in both animal and plant communities. Um, this may result from um, the tolerances of different species to environmental conditions um, it can also because of some pressures uh, and differences in available resources. And these changes in the floral and faunal communities may affect the dynamics of species interactions by influencing what type of seeds can arrive at the age in terms of seed size and the species as well. So for example, um, the different environmental conditions at the forest age may lead to avoidance of the area by large bodied frugivores, which may result in some large seeded uh, species not being dispersed into the age habitat. So some of the goals of this research are to determine how um, age effect alter the composition of dispersal assemblages and how um, this pattern may reflect on the pattern of seed dispersal. And to address these questions, we conducted this research in a rainforest called Yufa Forest in eastern Madagascar. Its protection, it's an evergreen rainforest. Um, its protection is partly overseen by community-based management, but there are some intense anthropogenic pressures that are still persisting. The forest is bordered by a small expanse of suctional old field, which adjoined a small scale agricultural field. And based on our um, data, it had, the forest has at least 140 species of trees and large shrubs. And about 94% of these species have traits adapted for seed dispersal by animals. In our surveys of animal community in the area for a year, we have identified uh, 60 species of birds. 21 species of these birds have been found to feed mainly on fruits. We have also recorded 14 species of lemurs, of which 11 uh, feed on fruits. And we have identified two species of carnivores and two rodent species. Given the large proportions of lemurs and birds in the area and the fact that these are the known major taxonomic groups serving as primary seed dispersal agents in Malagasy ecosystem among these um, taxa, we focus on these taxonomic groups for our seed dispersal community. Um, the first point we looked at is how does the dispersal assemblage differ between the age forest and the interior habitat? 
Specifically, we were looking at what species are found in each habitat type and what are their size. So we found that the frugivores present at the forest edge were uh, slightly smaller than those in the forest interior habitat. However, um, this pattern was mainly driven by the difference in size among the lemurs that are present in the edge versus the interior habitat, as you can see on the far right side of the graph. None of the bird species we found at the edge were actually edge specialists because all of them were also found in the interior habitat. And specifically for the case of lemurs, the age habitat was uh, frequented by small sized omnivorous lemurs, like the case of Microsibus and Avahe. And in other systems in Madagascar, um, these species have also been found to have a very flexible diet and high tolerance to different type of forest, such as disturbed habitat. So they are frequently observed to forage in forest age habitats. So it is not surprising that we would also find them at the age habitat in this system. Regarding the identity of the species present in each habitat type, there was an overlap between the two, um, the two habitat type. Uh, however, some species were observed in the interior habitat only. So for example, some large sized fruit eating pigeons and large sized lemur frugivores were only observed in the interior habitat, at least during our study period. And these differences in the composition of animal community between the two habitat types may be a result of the variable tolerance levels of the different animal species to the environmental conditions at the age. Also, um, the age habitat may have some higher hunting pressures of altered forest structure and also low food availability that may not favor the presence of certain animal species. Well, if age interior um, habitat, age and interior habitat differ in seed disperser community, how might this difference relate to pattern of animal mediated seed dispersal, uh, specifically in terms of seed dispersal rate and seed size? So we examine that by monitoring animal mediated seed rain using seed traps in both habitat type for a year. And we only focused on the seeds that were actively dispersed by animals. In terms of seed dispersal rate, based on the count of animal mediated uh, seed rain into the traps, we found that the rates were similar between the two habitat types, as you can see on the graph uh, here. However, um, the trend in seed size, the, um, the bird in the size of, <coughs> However, the trend in the size of seeds um, dispersed by animals into age versus interior habitat mirrored the body size trends of frugivores that were observed in these habitats, such that the seed um, dispersed by animals in the forest age were on average smaller in size than those in the forest interior habitat. One of the reasons we see these patterns may be because the small nocturnal lemurs and the habitat generalist bird species, which are also smaller in size compared to the lemur frugivores in the interior habitat, may have compensated for the forest specialist frugivores that were missing from, um, from the age in this system. So they will still be dispersing the same amount of seeds as in the interior habitat, but of different species and of different size, um, seed, um, seed size. So to summarize the points I presented, uh, first we found that larger frugivores, especially lemurs, tended to avoid the disturbed habitat found in forest ages. And secondly, while we did not find a significant difference in the rates of animal, seed uh, animal mediated seed dispersal between the two habitats, the seeds reaching the age habitat through dispersal by frugivores were smaller in size than those that, that were dispersed in the interior. And 
So such findings suggest that frugivores may act as a potential biotic filter for incoming dispersal of plant propagules. So this project is still a work in progress and there are still a lot of points we are considering regarding the impact of age creation on seed dispersal processes. So hopefully I will have more in the near future. Uh, but for now, I'd like to thank you for watching my presentation and there are a number of people and organizations that I'm grateful for in the execution of this project. Uh, thank you. Hi, my name is Lauren Maynard. I'm a PhD student at Virginia Tech, and today we're going to talk about how plant chemistry affects fruit development, defense, and dispersal. Plants interact with a wide array of organisms, including both antagonists and mutualists. Their antagonists can, can include pathogens, herbivores, and competitors, while their mutualists may include seed dispersers, pollinators, and beneficial microbes. However, rooted in place, how do plants balance these complex and sometimes conflicting interactions? They use chemistry. Plants are amazing chemical factories producing a wide arsenal of compounds. So the task of studying plant chemistry can be difficult because so much is still unknown. In the past, leaves and their associated herbivores have been studied the most. However, other tissues, including fruits, can be particularly interesting given their differing selection pressures. The overall question that chemical ecology aims to answer is why? Why is there such great diversity of plant chemistry and why is it important? To begin to answer these questions, we travel to La Salva Biological Station, which, sit, which sits along a tropical wet forest in Costa Rica. The overwhelming biodiversity we see in the tropics magnifies its chemical diversity, which means studying the chemical ecology can be tricky because most secondary metabolites, particularly in fruits, are undescribed and have numerous potential roles and in interactions with mutualists and antagonists. In our paper published last year in Ecology, we embarked on this process of discovery by tackling four more manageable questions. And those include what, where, when, and how. Specifically, what compounds are in the plant? Where are they occurring? When are they occurring? And how are they serving the plant? The protagonist of our story is a plant species, Piper sanctifolicis, which is related to Piper nigrum or black peppercorn. Um, Piper sanctifolicis is a first successional species and it's also an important food source for both bats and birds. And for this reason, we chose to use this um, system as a case study for secondary metabolite allocation and its ecological roles. Piper has inflorescences, which are spikes with hundreds of small flowers that ripen into infructescences, where the flowers become single seeded fruits along the spike. For brevity in this presentation, I'll call inflorescences flowers and the infructescences fruits. The fruits of Piper develop and ripen successively or successively along a branch. From left to right here, we see one um, developing flower, two mature flowers, two unripe fruits, and one ripe fruit. To get an idea of the texture of these ripe Piper sanctifolicis fruits, here's a Corellia perspicillata bat chowing down on one. Piper sanctifolicis has its own suite of antagonists and mutualists, including pathogenic fungi and vertebrate seed dispersers. So now that we're familiar with the plant and the system, let's start to answer our four questions. First, starting with what are the compounds? This work was done by our collaborators at the University of Nevada, Reno at the Hitchcock Center for Chemical Ecology, where they used both NMR and EIMS analysis to identify 10 dominant compounds in the class of phenophenol. And here we see three representative structures of those compounds. Second, we asked where the compounds occur. On this graph, we have on the x-axis five different tissue types, including vegetative and reproductive. On the y-axis is total alkenophenols measured in proportion dry weight. We found that fruits had the highest concentrations, both ripe and unripe. This was followed by flowers and then by seeds and leaves. Additionally, the leaves and the seeds only had two of the compounds at detectable levels. So overall, fruit pulp has higher alkenophenol concentrations and diversity. Next, we asked, when do they occur? Since the reproductive tissues have the highest concentrations, we looked across their stages of development from developing flower to ripe pulp. And you can see that here along the x-axis. On the y-axis, again, we had total alkenophenols. The colored lines are individual plants over tissue ripening. The bold black line here is a nonlinear fit of the data. 
And we see that the investment of alkenophenols follows a nonlinear trend of a reproductive structure development that peaks just before ripening. So we saw a nonlinear allocation of alkenophenols across fruit development. Our last question, how do the compounds serve the plant? And we'll bring back our antagonistic fun fungi and our mutualistic seed dispersers. To assess the interactions with antagonists, we performed a microdilution assay. And these assays were done by our collaborators at the University of Guelph and OTS. Three of the most common fungal taxa found on the seeds were selected. And these included two fusarium species, which we call A and B, and microdochium lycopotinum. So now on the XS, we see alkenophenol concentration, and on the Y, we have average absorbance, which measures um, fungal growth. We found that even at conservative doses, uh, relative to the concentrations found in the fruit pulp, alkenophenols had an antifungal activity against two of the three fungal taxa. Lastly, we observed in the we observed and experimented with the vertebrate seed dispersers of Piper. First, we observed fruit removal. On the, y, on the X axis, we have nocturnal or diurnal seed dispersal. And on the Y axis, the number of fruits removed. So here we see that bats remove about 11 times more fruits than birds, and birds remove a higher proportion of unripe fruits. Bats in the genus Corellia are considered to be piper specialists and rely on their fruit for their main source of food throughout the year, with a nightly diet consisting of about 40 to 100% piper fruits. Previous studies, as well as our own personal observations, concluded that Passerini's tanager was the most common bird frugivore of piper sanctiflicis. And here we see an adult female Passerini's tanager eating an unripe piper fruit. We conducted uh, flight cage studies, and I chose Piper Sanctifolicis and Passerini's tanager as my two representative species. Flight cages were designed to, assess, to test the animal's feeding preference, where each animal was presented with two dishes, one supplemented with aquinophenols and one not. The animals tended to test the two dishes, and then after they had sampled both, they would make a decision that we see here. So here we have two graphs, bats on the left and birds on the right. On the x-axis, we have control or no supplement, and then treatment, which was supplemented with alkenophenols. On the y-axis, the average amount of fruit eaten by an individual. So we see that bats had a clear aversion to alkenophenols, evidenced by their decrease in food consumption. Birds, however, did not have a clear aversion or attraction to the compounds. So alkenophenols deterred bats, but did not deter birds. So let's put together what we found, going back to our four questions of what, where, when, and how. What, we found 10 alkenophenols in Piper sanctifolicis. Where, the highest concentrations in diversity were found in the fruit pulp. When, we saw a nonlinear trend of allocation across ripening where it increased and then decreased as the fruit became ripe. And how are they serving the plant? We saw they had antifungal properties, but this made them less tasty to bats. So our results are consistent with the hypothesis that the defense is allocated um, by fitness. Where alkenophenols function in unripe fruits to defend, the, defend against antagonists and are invested according to fitness consequences of fruit removal. And the compounds were highest in the, in the fruit pulp. They were defending the plant from potentially pathogenic fungi. However, that came at a cost to bat disperser palatability. And a similar scenario is seen in other systems um, where the birds seem to have a higher threshold for secondary metabolites in fruits compared to small mammals. Uh, we see this particularly in hot peppers and birds, where birds are the better dispersers and they deter small mammals. However, in this case, the deterrent effect is against the most common and likely most effective disperser. And so that's why we believe there's a possible explanation for the decrease during ripen ripening for the selective pressure exerted on fruit chemistry by bat feeding preferences that do not like the alkenophenols. So to go back to our big question of why, to answer this, we need holistic integrative studies with multi-trophic interactions that include both antagonist and mutualist. And in the bigger scope of things, it's important to explore chemical diversity and the pressures that drive it. As we continue to lose biodiversity in the Anthropocene, we will continue to lose chemical diversity as well as its many benefits to science and society. 
I'd like to thank my co-authors again on this paper, Maynard et al. 2020 and Ecology, as well as all the other assistance and expertise and funding we received along the way. If you have any questions, again, my name is Lauren Maynard. There's my email and the website to our lab um, website. <laughs> thank you. Excellent. Great. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, for listening to our talks. Uh, we're still, unfortunately, down. One of our speakers wasn't able to make it. Sandra's not here. So I do have some questions in the Q&A sidebar here. And remember, if you haven't asked a question through that, use that instead of the chat. Uh, so the Q&A on Zoom feature. We've answered a few questions through typing, but I have saved a couple to answer live. And we have about 10 minutes or so to go through those. And remember, you can ask questions, especially for Lauren, because her talk was at the end. So get those questions in the Q&A and we will address them. So I have a couple uh, geared towards my talk, which I will field right now live. Uh, the first one is from Pierre-Michel Forget. He says, all tested species are large. This was in, in my talk and lacking elephants in Costa Rica, who besides humans could transport seeds, these large seeds far away at medium and high altitudes. And so that's, yeah, all of these seeds I mentioned in my talk were at least two or three centimeters in diameter. Some of them dipteryx are really, really large, six centimeters plus in size, in length. Um, yeah, we don't have big proboscideans in Costa Rica, unfortunately, like in Africa. And the things that would be, now I'm talking about terrestrial organisms too. I've kind of neglected the arboreal or volant animals that might be moving these around. So there are bats that could be moving big seeds pretty far. There are some large bodied birds as well that could be transporting these species up the mountain. I'm a little more concerned with secondary seed dispersal on the ground. So after its seeds fall to the ground, what animals are interacting with them there? So regarding the terrestrial component of upslope seed dispersal for these large seeds, it would be tapers predominantly. They do come into the lowlands and they range into the middle elevations upslope to the pre-montane and montane forest in Barva. Uh, those are the largest bodied terrestrial frugivores that could move these large seeds. We also do have peccaries and agoutis, but again, peccaries are mostly restricted to the lowlands. We see them in La Selva. They are moving these not through endozoochory, just because the seeds are so large. This would be um, kind of a, a form of ectozoochory where they're taking the seeds in their mouths, chewing on them, trying to eat them maybe, and then spitting them out somewhere as they move upslope. I don't think that would be an appreciable upslope movement though. Agoutis would be moving these in, um, kind of smaller scale than a taper potentially, but many incremental movements upslope could result in a large kind of jump upslope. So I would say agoutis, peccaries, tapers would be the dominant large bodied terrestrial animals moving these seeds. Um, let me see, I'm going to go through, Onza answered a question in the in Q and A. Unfortunately, I can't field Sandra's questions, uh, but I do think an alternative might be save them. Contact her through email if you have a, a burning question that you want her to answer. I'm going to go to another question here from Massiege. I don't know if I pronounced your name correctly, I apologize. Uh, I'm curious, this is again towards, towards my talk, I'm curious whether you tested seed size as a predictor in your models. Have you considered testing an effect of herbivores on seedling recruitment? Yeah, so seed size, we haven't explicitly parsed that out just because we, we clumped these seeds into kind of dispersal mode. So we were saying, okay, large seeded things dispersed by terrestrial mammals, eaten by terrestrial mammals. So we haven't kind of gotten to that finer scale uh, effective size in our models yet. So I'll, I'll put that yet at the end there. Um, have we considered testing an effect of herbivores on seedling recruitment? Yep, you read my mind. So we have kind of a grand vision for this project where we're parsing out things like pathogens. So we're looking at natural enemies of all sorts, right? Seed predators, herbivores, so that the guys eating the plants, not just the seeds, the, the leaf material, the stems, um, pathogens, things like that. We would love to do a large scale gradient project where we have exclosures of different types, maybe, um, 
herbivore exclusion versus seed predator exclusion of different sizes and looking at how that affects seedling recruitment at different elevations. We just haven't gotten there yet. We need to, we need to get some funding to do that. It's pretty difficult to work on these tropical mountains, uh, but it, it, it's a really good payoff if we're able to do it. So yeah, you read my mind. This is on the docket for us, hopefully. Um, let me see, I do have a question now for Lauren. So Lauren, unmute yourself after I read the question. Uh, this is from Flavia and she says, by higher diversity in ripe fruits, do you mean more compounds or higher diversity of NMR peaks? So that's for Lauren. Hey, thank you for your question. Um, so for the, the targeted compounds that we were looking at, the alkenophenols, we found 10 in the plant. And in the pulp, we found all 10, but in the seeds and the leaves, we were only able to detect two of the 10. So that's what I'm talking about with the, the lower diversity in the seeds and the, and the leaves. Oh, I'm seeing it. Okay, thank you, Lauren. That was excellent. Um, let me see, I have, a question from somebody. Can the moderator read the questions and the responses, please? I can't see them in the Q&A. Okay, yes, I will get to those, Beth. Uh, I'm going to field this other question. We just had the one from Lauren. We have about, we still have about nine minutes until the end of the session, so we have plenty of time to go over the questions uh, that were previously answered through typing. Uh, I'm going to field this question from Emilio. This is geared towards my talk. Um, are there, so I talked about seed elevators in my talk. Emilio wants to know, are there also pollen elevators? Could gene flow or the lack thereof influence the capacity for germination and establishment at different elevations? Uh, yeah, I don't see why not. I mean, that's very outside my scope. I'm very seed biased in my, in my work, but uh, yeah, pollinators, maybe uh, bats, birds were thinking, I'm vertebrate biased as well. Uh, yeah, I think there could be that. Insects, we'll, we'll dabble into that, yeah. It could be uh, moving things upslope. And again, the volant animals, the, the flying animals, the arboreal animals are going to be much more effective big movers for these, for these genes to move upslope, uh, much more effective seed or pollen elevators, I think. So yeah, that's definitely a piece of, of this story that we do need to investigate further. And I think it's, uh, as I kind of, answered before. I think it's a, a question ripe for the asking. So, okay. I don't think I see any more um, live questions. Again, we still have about eight minutes or so. So if you want to throw questions in the Q&A, please do so. And I will answer those live or the other speakers will answer them live. If not, I'm going to go through the questions that were answered through typing. And uh, because I've been talking a while, I'm actually going to go to the question that was geared to Ons by Beth Kaplan. Um, and I will actually have Ons read that one if, if you would like, just because I've been speaking a lot. <laughs> the one from Beth. Do you see it in the answered column, Ons? Uh, yes. I think so. Um, oh, so the question from Beth was, what was the surrounding land use type of uh, matrix? And was it homogeneous? And do you think the type of age also affect how the seed dispersers respond? So it's um, bordered by like a small expanse of successional old field and then like some uh, small scale agricultural field. It's mainly subsistence uh, rice field. And I think it does affect how the different seed dispersers respond, especially for the case of the large lemurs. Not so much for the birds, because we've seen the birds at the age, but also at the interior of the forest. Great. <laughs> Is, do you have more to add? No, I think that was the only one I got. Okay, I'll, I'll just keep reading them then, uh, because someone from the audience wanted us to read these as well. Uh, let me see. Flavia had asked a question to myself earlier, asking if we already find lowland plants in these higher elevations. Uh, and if we do, are they becoming rare in the lowlands? Um, so yeah, it's true. We haven't done a ton of work yet at the edges of these ranges, the elevational ranges. Um, and this is kind of a problem we always face as ecologists is where do we work? Do we work 
in the forest interior or the habitat interior, wherever we're looking? Do we look at the ecotones? Do we look at the edges and, and what's happening there? And we have to make choices. So we haven't looked at that too much yet. In terms of the elevations I was talking about, those are really big jumps. And uh, we don't see any of these lowland species, the species that I discussed in my talk, yet they don't range above 500 meters. So they're not pushing into the pre-montane forest, the lower border of pre-montane forest yet. Uh, and again, I think it's it would be interesting to look at doing more field experiments, doing more seed tracking experiments kind of throughout the elevational range, uh, ranges of these lowland species to see where the movement might be greatest. And if they can make a little movement past that edge, maybe they can jump into new habitat and use the seed dispersers in that zone to move upslope. And I'm just gonna go down the list. We have five minutes still. So, oh, there are more, are there more questions too? Yes. Okay, so I have a couple here. I have one to Lauren. So this is from Eduardo Zanetti. Uh, what are the concurring hypotheses explaining the nonlinear increase in alkenyl phenol, I might have not said that right, except bat seed dispersal. Do other defense chemicals described in the literature follow the same pattern of increase during fruit development? So that's all yours, Lauren. Hi, thank you for the question. Yeah, so we actually put three um, hypotheses in our paper um, to what we think the investment or the allocation of phytochemicals in fruit would be over time. And so the first two would be linear, so they'd be a linear increase or a linear decrease. And then the third would be the nonlinear allocation where there's something that's driving that. And so our hypothesis with that would be seed viability. And so you see the, the nonlinear push of that would be when a seed becomes viable and it can um, germinate and establish. And so one of the glare, what I think is one of the glaring things missing from this work is like a germination or an establishment um, trial, which we tried to do. I went through a lot of bird and bat poop to, <laughs> to answer this question. And then like many things, you know, it just didn't quite work out. Um, but yeah, if you would like to check out the paper, again, it's Maynard et al. 2020 um, in ecology. We kind of go into those, um, those three different hypotheses for, for why a fruit would be investing um, their chemicals in any sort of um, trend over time. Awesome. And actually, Lauren, before we start winding up, there's another question for you here from the Symposium's Hoover page by Bea Mas. Uh, which implications may your findings have for agricultural and crop management? Uh, yeah, if you want to answer that, go for it. Well, that's hard. So um, this species, so Piper Sanctiflisus, it's related to Piper nigrum, which is really important for in the spice world and the agricultural world. This species itself is not, so it's just ecologically important as it tends to colonize um, an area after disturbance. Um, but I think looking at these questions at this stage, it's pretty basic. It's just like, what is there? And so as we move forward, we can make more um, applications to agriculture and to food science and things like that. But this was just like the base level, what's there and how is it serving the plant in an ecological realm and how did it evolve that way so that we can maybe put that into more human and societal um, applications. Excellent, great. So there are a couple of more questions, but I think we need to start wrapping things up. We have a minute or two left. Uh, so if you do have questions that we haven't been able to answer live or through the Q&A chat feature, uh, please post them on that Whova, the symposium's Whova page, and we can answer them there or email any of us. I'm sure we would be more than happy to respond to you and to interact with you. Uh, so I'm, I will wrap things up today. Thank you everyone for joining us today. This has been a great, excellent discussion. This was the whole point of this symposium. Uh, so I'm really happy to see so many people out and asking great questions. Thank you the speakers for your amazing talks. I love this. Stay tuned for next year in Cartagena where we can be live potentially all together. I also wanna thank Javi, our Zoom tech for being amazing in the behind the scenes. Um, and again, remember you can still communicate through Whova uh, with all of us to get your questions answered. And I think that will do it for this session. Uh, we can see everybody after the break, join for the, the rest of ATBC. Thank you everyone. Mm-hmm. <laughs>